News of the Times, Serial Killer Saturdays, The Socialite Serial Killer. Welcome to News of the Times. In today's episode, it is 1894 Antwerp. The whole of Belgium is rocked with the news that famous socialite Madame Jonio has been arrested for three murders within her family. The news is almost too incredible to comprehend. Madame Jonio, at the forefront in high society, is accused of murdering her own sister, brother, and the uncle of her husband. Her husband, Monsieur Jonio, who is a high official within the government, has managed to avoid any accusation. As her history is investigated, more sudden and strange deaths come to light. We take a look at the sensational case of socialite Madame Jonio and the series of family deaths that accompanied her in today's episode of Serial Killer Saturdays. We hope you enjoyed the show. In April of 1894, the whole of Belgium was rocked by the news of the alleged serial slayings of various family members by Madame Jonio, a woman who was a mainstay in the highest social standing tiers and who was known by everyone due to her impeccable family pedigree. The news was so shocking it was secretly investigated by police and newspapers for several weeks before releasing the information. From the Edinburgh Evening News, 18th of April, 1894, alleged insurance murders. A central news telegram dated Antwerp Wednesday says, Madame Jonio has been arrested today on suspicion of having poisoned some wealthy friends and relatives in order to obtain insurance money. The amount of the insurance is stated to be between £4,000 and £6,000. The case has excited the most intense interest throughout Belgium, the newspapers having, for some time, guardedly referred to the mysterious deaths and the probable arrests of certain persons implicated. Madame Jonio is a daughter of the well-known and eminent late General Abele, and she and her husband moved in the best Belgium society. Madame Jonio was the daughter of General Abele, known as one of the finest carol- cavalry soldiers in the Belgium army. She was also the niece of the former aide-de-camp to King Leopold. She had married Monsieur Frederick Faber, a noted author and bibliophile. Monsieur Faber was famous but poor. To help offset costs, the Fabers took in a paying lodger, Monsieur Jonio. Monsieur Faber conveniently died in 1884, allowing her to marry the lodger, Monsieur Jonio, who had a very high role in the government. Monsieur and Madame Jonio were highly active in the highest levels of society within Belgium. However, Monsieur Jonio's relatively modest salary within the government was unable to sustain the high levels of expenditure required to maintain their social position. From Lloyd's Weekly News, the 17th of March, 1909, Madame Jonio. Madame Marie Therese Jonio, the second wife of a distinguished engineer holding a government appointment at Antwerp, was known in Belgian society as a beautiful and brilliant woman with charming manners and a fondness for the pleasure of the card table. The daughter of a distinguished soldier, General Jules Abelé, she had as a young girl enjoyed social celebrity, and it was considered quite a romance that soon after her father's death she fell in love and married 
a studious man with anything but a large income. The husband of her choice was Monsieur Frederick Faber, a well-known bibliophile and historian. The modest means of Monsieur Faber did not prevent Madame Faber, who had inherited very little from her father, continuing to entertain and to lead the life of a woman of fashion. But with these outward shows there was little economies practised in the Faber household. One of these economies was the receiving into the family circle of a paying guest. This paying guest was Monsieur Henry Jonio, a clever engineer who some years previously had come to Brussels to take up a well-paid government appointment, bringing his wife and family with him. In Brussels, Monsieur Jonio's wife died, and it was after her death that he took up his residence with the Fabers, whose acquaintance he made soon after he came to the Belgian capital. On December the 4th, 1884, Monsieur Faber died of a sudden attack of gout. In 1886, it was announced that Monsieur Jonio, a widower, had taken as his second wife the charming widow of his old friend and host, Monsieur Faber. House of Death It is said that Monsieur Jonio and his wife were a devoted couple, and apparently the world was going well with them. Soon after the wedding, Monsieur Jonio made a further advance in his profession and was promoted to the post of chief engineer in connection with some government works at Antwerp. In Antwerp, the happy pair took a fine house near the Boulevard Leopold at number 33, Rue de Nevien, where they lived luxuriously and entertained lavishly. In their home in the ultra-chic address of Rue de Nevien, visitors had a habit of dying. Conveniently, they were all insured with the insurance terms favouring members of the Jonio household. From the Scotsman, the 19th of April, 1894, alleged for murder in Belgium, arrest of a lady of position, a remarkable story. Madame Jonio, wife of Monsieur Henry Jonio, chief state engineer of roads and bridges in the province of Antwerp, was arrested this morning on charges of murdering several of her relatives in order to obtain the large sums for which their lives had been insured. This arrest is merely the prelude to the most sensational murder trial that has ever taken place in this country, whether it be judged by the atrocious character of the crimes alleged, the social position of the actors in the tragedy, or the remarkable recklessness or daring of the criminals. For the last seven or eight weeks, public rumour has been busy with this case, but owing to the exalted position of the suspected persons, the newspapers have not dared to do more than vaguely hint at a forthcoming scandal, because it was well understood that the first that published any name in connection with the case would be prosecuted for libel. The necessity for continued reticence has been removed by the arrest of Madame Jonio and the independence edge with characteristic enterprise and promptitude takes the lead today with a full history of the case based upon inquiries upon which 20 members of its staff have been engaged for several weeks past. The accused woman, Marie-Thérèse Jonio, is a daughter of the late distinguished Belgian general Abelé, who was in his day the finest cavalry soldier in Belgium. She is niece of General Omar Abelé, formerly aide-de-camp to King Leopold, and of General Narcisse Abelé. 
She was born in 1842 and married Monsieur Frederick Faber, a well-known bibliophile and author of the French theatre in Belgium. Monsieur Faber died in December 1884 from supposed gout, it was said, and in 1886 the widow became the wife of Monsieur Jonio, who had been left a widower eight years previously. Although occupying a most important position in the government service, Monsieur Jonio's salary was only about £400 a year, worth approximately £65,000 in 2024, and his wife had practically no means of her own. But the couple lived in first-rate style in a large mansion having an imposing frontage in the Rue de Nevien, a few steps only from the well-known Boulevard Leopold. In this house died successively the persons for the alleged murder of whom Madame Jonio is now in custody. It was the small salary and extravagant manner of living of Monsieur and Madame Jonio, coupled with the fact that they were heavily in debt, that first caused the police to ask themselves the question how the couple could possibly hope to pay several heavy insurance premiums, the last of which alone amounted to about £145 per annum, worth approximately £22,000 in 2024. The alleged victims of Madame Jonia were, victim one, Mademoiselle Leon Abelet, sister, the unmarried sister, Mademoiselle Leon Abelet died at Monsieur Jonio's house when she was on a visit in Antwerp in March 1892, aged 42 years, after only a few days' illness during which she was nursed by her sister. Death was attributed to an attack of influenza followed by pneumonia. The body was taken to Brussels and interred in the cemetery. On the 20th of last March, in consequence of the sinister rumours then current, the body was exhumed and examined by doctors, surgeons and poison experts. Mademoiselle Leonie Abelé, who lived on a small allowance made by her relatives, was insured in the Netherlands Company for 70,000 francs for the benefit of Madame Jonio's daughter by her first husband. The insurance premiums were paid by Monsieur and Madame Jonio. Victim 2. Monsieur Jacques Jean van der Kirchhoff, uncle of M Monsieur Jonio. The second victim was Monsieur Jacques Jean van der Kirchhoff, the great and wealthy cotton manufacturer of Ghent, an uncle to Monsieur Jonio. Monsieur Kirchhoff was a staff colonel of the Civic Guard of Ghent, president of its leading club and friend to the principal nobles and government officials of that city and province. He was a daring and skilful horseman, a man of great stature and physical strength, and of robust health. He was a bachelor over 60 years of age, but the Independence Belge Papers states that shortly before his death he told some of his friends confidently that he intended to marry a young lady by whom he had had a son, and he proposed to leave the bulk of his fortune to that son. On the 17th of March, 1893, Monsieur Kirchhoff went to Antwerp at the invitation of his nephew, Monsieur Jonio. At dinner that same evening, Monsieur Kirchhoff was taken suddenly ill and died in Jonio's house a few hours afterwards, or, according to the registrar's certificate, at noon p.m. the 16th. The doctors who were called in attributed death to cerebral congestion. The remains were interred in the cemetery at Ghent, the funeral being almost a public ceremony owing to the position 
of the deceased. At the beginning of last month, the body was exhumed in order to ascertain whether there was any foundation for the popular rumour that death, as in the case of Mademoiselle Abelay, was due to poison. Only a few weeks before his death, Monsieur Kirchhoff had insured his life for a large sum for the benefit of Monsieur and Madame Jonio in a Belgian office. Victim 3. Monsieur Alfred Abelay, brother to Madame Jonio. The third victim was Monsieur Alfred Abelay, son of the late General Abelay and brother of Madame Jonio. He was born in December 1840. He entered the army and attained the rank of captain, but retired on the death of his wife. Thereafter, he led a wild and adventurous life and was for some time in Argentina. His dissipated habits and passion for gambling brought him so low that it is said for a time he was glad to follow the humble evocation of conductor for tramcars in Buenos Aires. He returned to Europe in 1877 and went into business in Paris and subsequently in Algeria. He turned up in Antwerp in February this year and went to reside with his sister in the fatal house in the Rue de Nervins. A few weeks later, on the 6th of March this year, he died in the house suddenly and as unaccountably as did his sister and his uncle before him. Death was attributed to disease of the heart. He was buried in the cemetery in Lubbock on the 15th, eight days after the interment. The remains were exhumed and examined by the same experts who had been engaged to examine the bodies of the two previous victims. Monsieur Alfred Abelay was insured on the Gresham Life Insurance Company for 100,000 francs. The insurance was effected only a few days before Alfred Abelay's death for the benefit of his sister and the first quarterly premium amounting to about £36 was paid by Monsieur Jonio. At the time, Alfred Abelay was absolutely penniless. The foregoing facts are virtually indisputed and all the questions that remain to be settled are, among others, the nature of the poison which caused the deaths of Madame Jonio's three relatives, for the poison was found in the bodies and by whom it was administered. It is remarkable that the Belgian insurance company La Valois took no action, although the rumour that Mademoiselle Abelay was poisoned had been generally current for months and had been hinted at in the newspapers. The exposure is due to the Gresham Company, who, on hearing of the rumours, sent a special agent to Antwerp and subsequently brought the matter formally to the notice of the police, who had then no option but to institute a private preliminary inquiry into the facts. Madame and Monsieur Jonio had great expectations from their rich relative, Monsieur Kirchhoff, and immediately after his death they acted on the assumption that they were his heirs-in-law. Monsieur Kirchhoff died at midday on the 17th of March last year. On the evening of that same day he was to have given a dinner party in Ghent in celebration of his promotion to the grade of officer in the Order of Leopold. The guests were actually assembled when Monsieur Jonio, accompanied by his lawyer, walked into the room and announced that their friend and host was dead. Monsieur Jonio then requested a justice of the peace, who also accompanied him, to place seals on the effects of the deceased. While this was being done, Monsieur Jonio ordered his uncle's young mistress to quit the house, saying that she had thenceforth no business there. 
the lady replied that, on the contrary, she had more right there than Monsieur Jonio had, seeing that the house was the property of her son, and she then informed Monsieur Jonio of the existence of a will constituting Monsieur Kirchhoff's illegitimate son his universal legatee. This was the first intimation Monsieur Jonio received of the existence of a will, and he did not attempt to conceal his chagrin. It has since been ascertained that the bequest of Monsieur and Madame Jonio was a comparatively small one and consisted of shares of uncertain value in a match factory. It has also been ascertained recently that there were two policies on the life of Mademoiselle Leone Ablé, one for 30,000 francs and another for 40,000 francs in a different insurance company, the latter having been affected only a month before the death. Both insurances were for the benefit of Madame Jonio's daughter, who has since married. The money has been duly paid over to her. The magisterial inquiry into this remarkable case has been conducted with such secrecy that it is impossible to ascertain the value and extent of the evidence in the possession of the authority. Madame Jonio has many friends who reject with indignation all suggestions that she can be guilty of the terrible and unnatural crimes charged against her. Public opinion is undeniably prejudiced against the prisoner. The arrest has caused an enormous sensation throughout Belgium. Among the three deaths, the death that started the questions and investigation was the last one of her brother, who was healthy but penniless. Questions arose as to why the Jonios were investing so much with the heavy insurance premiums into their relatives. It was in February 1892 that Monsieur and Madame Jonio had, with deep sorrow, to inform their friends of the cruel loss they had sustained by the death of Mademoiselle Leone Ablé, who had died suddenly at 33 Rue de Nervians from an attack of influenza. It was in March 1893 that Monsieur and Madame Jonia had to inform their friends of the cruel loss they had sustained by the sudden death of Madame's uncle, Monsieur Jacques Van de Kerkhov, at 33 Rue de Nervians, from a sudden attack of cerebral hemorrhage. It was in February 1894 that Monsieur and Madame Jonio had to inform their friends of the cruel loss they had sustained by the sudden death of Madame's brother, Monsieur Alfred Abelé, at 33 Rue de Nervians, from a sudden attack of heart disease. Influenza, cerebral hemorrhage, heart disease. According to the certificates of death signed by a medical man who was called into number 33, these were the causes of the three cruel losses which overwhelmed Monsieur and Madame Jonio with such deep sorrow. But when the certificate of Monsieur Alfred Abelet's death was received at the Gresham Life Office, accompanied by a claim for 100,000 francs, or 4,000 pounds in English money, worth approximately 620,000 pounds in 2024, the managing director, Mr. Perrin, was, to use a homely phrase, somewhat taken aback. The policy of insurance on the life of Monsieur Alfred Abelé, a strong, healthy man of 42, had only been issued a few days previous to Madame Jonio through the Brussels office, 
Mr. Perrin telegraphed to Brussels only to find that the notice of death had been given after the body had been buried. As investigations gain momentum, it is established that Madame Jonio had purchased considerable amounts of morphine by copying the initial prescription and taking them to different chemists within Brussels. It is also discovered that Madame Jonio had purchased arsenic. As the exhumation of the bodies proceeds, evidence is collected. From the Scotsman, the 21st of April, 1894, the poisoning cases in Belgium. Madame Jonio will appear tomorrow morning before the Chamber of the Council, and there is little doubt that a warrant for her arrest will be confirmed. The Crown, having during the past few days obtained evidence of a very compromising character, it has been known for a week past that traces of poison had been found in the viscera of Monsieur Abelé, the brother of the accused, but more certain proof was necessary. The prosecution has recently ascertained that several chemists sold morphine to Madame Jonio on the authority of a doctor's prescription, and their evidence led to the arrest of the prisoner. The Gazette states under reserve that arsenic is said to have been found in the viscera of Mademoiselle Abelé, the sister of Madame Jonio. As the investigation proceeds, the life of Monsieur and Madame Jonio is looked at in detail, with some interesting facts emerging. From the Lloyd's Weekly News, the 17th of March, 1909, Madame Jonio, a searching Inquiry was at once made into the private life of Madame Jonio, and two important facts were ascertained. One was that the society lady had, for years past, been in financial difficulties and had had borrowed money in every direction, often at extortionate interest, and the other was that she had at various times procured a quantity of morphia. It was ascertained that she had benefited financially by the death of her uncle, who, had he lived, would have been married in a few days and would have then made a will in favour of his wife and her son. It was perplexing that her sister, Leonie, was insured for three thousand pounds and that the money had gone to Madame Jonio and that each of the three deaths had happened suddenly after the victims had been specially invited to come to stay at number 33. It was also discovered that each of the three deaths had taken place at a time when it was absolutely necessary for Madame to have a sum of money in hand with which to settle the pressing claims of a creditor for money lent. On April the 18th, 1894, the charming Madame Jonio was arrested and charged with the murder of the three relatives who had died so suddenly in her beautiful home. It's hard to describe the intensity of this case within Belgium at the time. Jack the Ripper, the Gouffet case in France, and the American O.J. Simpson trial would be equals to the prominence of this story within Belgium. As Madame Jonio is arrested, she is hissed and booed by the public when she is taken to the preliminary inquiry. Then, shortly afterwards, a fourth previous mysterious death associated with the family is uncovered. The event had taken place before the Antwerp murders were investigated. From Lloyd's Weekly News, the 17th of March, 1909, Madame Jonio, some little time before the tragedies at Antwerp occurred, a young relative, Lionel, a youth, had been found dead under extraordinary circumstances in a pond on the family estate. He did not come to breakfast one morning, and a search was made, and 
Lionel Abelay was found lying under the water with his feet tied up in a sack. It was explained that he had been practicing for a sack race and must have gone too near the pond and fallen in. The Belgian press explained that Madame Jonio benefited by this extraordinary death, but there was never the slightest proof that she was in any way associated with this earlier tragedy in the unfortunate Abelay family. The trial. The trial was an event. The courtroom was filled with the highest classes, opera glasses in hand, watching the drama unfold with the keenest interest. The ordinary person who travelled in less glittering circles was far less impressed with Madame Jonio and possibly would have lynched her if the opportunity had presented itself. It is also important to note that even though some of the insurance premium payments were made by Monsieur Jonio, he was at no time indicted under suspicion of murder. The whole of the crimes were laid at the door of Madame Jonio. From the Lloyd's Weekly News, the 17th of March, 1909, Madame Jonio. Madame Jonio, after the preliminary examination in April 1894, remained in prison until January 1895. It was on January the 7th, a bitterly cold morning, with snow falling heavily, that a mighty crowd assembled outside the Assize Court of Antwerp. When the closed carriage in which the eagerly expected villainess of the greatest poison drama of the century was seated, drove through the howling mob, it was found that the gates by which she had entered were closed and locked. She sat cowering in the carriage while a gendarme went off for the keys. When the carriage drove into the enclosure and she alighted at the door for prisoners, it was seen that her face was white as death and that her teeth were chattering. It is cold, she was heard to say. I am frozen. Merciless cross-examination. When the doors of the court were opened, every available inch of space was quickly filled. Elegant ladies were there with opera glasses. Officers in military uniform made great patches of colour. The world of art and fetters was liberally represented, and amongst the distinguished audience were at least two ambassadors. All eyes were turned to the prisoner's dock, when after the judges had taken their seats, Therese Marie Jonio was summoned to appear. The little door at the back of the bench of the accused opened, and a tall, elegant lady clad in black, with a black hat decorated with a tiara and ostrich feathers, entered between two gendarmes. Madame Jonio wore a heavy veil, but directly she was called upon to speak, she threw it back and faced her judges. A statuesque figure with beautifully chiselled features, calm and dignified, she never once faltered in her brilliant fencing with the president, who, as is, is the custom in continental courts, made the most daring accusations against her and cross-examined her mercilessly on her replies to his question. Hearsay Evidence When the act of accusation was read, she punctuated it with shrugs of the shoulder, little tosses of the head, and elevations of the eyebrows, and all the little signs of criticism that can be conveyed by the play of the features. Questions put to her by the presiding judge sound strange in our English ears. You poisoned your three relatives, he said, by way of opening the proceedings. Do you deny it? Absolutely, replied the prisoner. And yet the deaths coincide with a remarkable manner with the periods at which it was necessary for you to find large sums of money. Madame Jonio shrugged her shoulders. It suits you to say so, was her quiet answer. Her defence was a simple refute. 
She stated that she had been fighting crushing debt for 15 years in every way she knew how, but that she was no murderess. But evidence would show that she was. From the Lloyd's Weekly News, the 17th of March, 1909, Madame Jonio, there was some poison found in the bodies of her victims, but that they had died from influenza, apoplexy or heart disease was proved to be utterly impossible in spite of the death certificates granted by the medical men. She had insured her brother and sister for large sums and then bought morphine, poisoned them and drew the insurance money. Deliberate Poisoner She pretended that her sister had insured herself and at her death the money might go to pay a sacred debt. A debt occurred by her mother, but she could not give the particulars because of an oath she had taken not. But Madame Jonio had the money and discharged some of her own debts with it. She had bought morphine before each death, and in each case the conditions of death were exactly those which would occur in cases of morphine poisoning. It was proved beyond the shadow of a doubt that the beautiful Madame Jonio, a born gambler, a woman who had been detected cheating at cards in private circles, trying to cheat at Spa, incurring suspicion at Monte Carlo, borrowing money under false pretenses, obtaining jewellery one day and pawning it the next, had, when all her sources of credit were exhausted, turned to life insurances as a means of obtaining money. She had insured her relatives for large sums and had deliberately poisoned them. The evidence was overwhelming, despite what many deemed was a masterful performance within the courtroom by her defence team and by herself. From Lloyd's Weekly News, the 17th of March, 1909, Madame Jonio guilty. The trial had commenced on the 7th of January. It came to an end in the early morning of Sunday, February the 3rd. In the afternoon of Saturday, the jury asked for an interval. They were weary, faint and exhausted. At seven o'clock, the court reassembled and the final speeches were made. Outside, a great crowd had gathered, waiting for the verdict. Snow was falling heavily but vast crowds waited on. Long after midnight, it was just upon two o'clock in the morning when the jury gave their verdict of guilty. Then the judge pronounced the awful sentence of the law on the woman of fashion with a white face and staring eyes heard that she was to die. It will be the first time she has lost her head, whispered an eyewitness filled with admiration for the marvellous murderess, still self-possessed, still by her iron will, keeping back her women's tears of misery and shame. It was twenty minutes to three when the condemned woman left the court and was driven across Antwerp through the blinding snow to her prison. A body of mounted guards rode by the side of the vehicle to protect her from the fury of the mob, who cried, Lynch her! The bars and restaurants of Antwerp had kept open to accommodate the vast number of peoples who had made a night of it, in order to hear the news at the earliest moment. But the death penalty had been abolished in Belgium, and there was no scaffold waiting for Therese Marie Jonio. Her sentence was speedily committed to penal servitude for life. Her appeal was rejected immediately. She died in Antwerp at the age of 79. Postscript. Historically, there has been speculation that she had killed her first husband, Monsieur Faber, as well as her young nephew, Lionel. Belgium by this time had ceased the execution of women, although it was officially still legal. Her 
Commutation to life in prison was expected, even with the number of killings laid at her door. That concludes this episode of Serial Killer Saturdays, the socialite serial killer. We very much hope you enjoyed the show. If you did enjoy the show, we will be grateful if you could like or subscribe to our little channel. We upload five days a week. Mondays are murderous as we delve into the dark side of Regency and Victorian crime. Wednesdays are wicked, where we pull together stories with a similar theme, such as Doctors of Death. Fridays are frightful, where we look at crimes in a location, such as stories from the stage to murder and scandal in the aristocracy. Saturdays is Serial Killer Saturdays, where we investigate serial killer stories from the past. And Sundays is a bit of fun with a unique mini murder mystery where you, the listener, have a chance to solve a murderous riddle. On the last Sunday of the month, we offer a two-hour compilation of stories based around a theme. Thank you again for watching and listening. This has been News of the Times, and I am Robin Coles.